On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Hello and welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. My name is Don and I'm a consultant in life sciences and I'll be your host. I'm the president and principal of 5280 Life Sciences Consulting and our focus is helping clients that are trying to scale with services that help them succeed. One example would be if you're trying to implement metrics in your business, you should go to our website and download our OKR guide uh, and my free course on OKRs. I also wanted to mention that I'll be at Bio in the Bayou next week, and uh, I'll be there streaming interviews, so please watch for announcements for broadcasts around the 2nd of November. Today, my guest is Ariel Laurier. Ariel focuses on entrepreneurship, operations, international sales, marketing, M&A, research, and patents. Welcome, Ariel. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me here today. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, for being a guest today. So can you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. My my background is uh, best described as a mess. Um, I, was, uh, I was born in Germany and I grew up in Germany and Belgium, did my schooling in the UK and um, I got tired of it all, jacked it all in and traveled around the world for a year until I ran out of money in the United States about a year later. And uh, also met my wife. That also increased the expenditure level. Um, <laughs> and then I was invited to postdoc at uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, where I stayed for, I, I stayed in the U.S. for about 18, uh, 18 months or thereabouts, and then returned back to the U.K. because it was the only other country at that time. Uh, we're talking about the early to mid 90s that had a vibrant biotechnology industry, and um, started. Uh, working there for about eight years uh, before I was recruited to run uh, a small biotechnology company on literally the side of the globe uh, on Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, which was, uh, well, frankly, I didn't even know where it was when they first contacted (laughs) me. Um, That uh, company was sold and I started my own company, Stressmark, about 14 or 15 years ago now, and I have stayed here ever since. Oh, very nice. And um, the one thing that, I, that I mean, if, if anybody gets a chance to check out Ariel on LinkedIn, uh, one of the very first things that comes up, comes up on his LinkedIn profile, we we're just talking about this as well, is that he's, he's a karate instructor. And I think he's the first uh, one interviewed on the show. And so, um, you know, I guess what, what interested you in getting started with karate? Uh, it's an interest I had as as a kid. I tried judo for a while. Um, when I first got to Belgium, I didn't speak a word of French, so I didn't really a- have a clue what they were asking me to do half the time. So um, I started karate a little bit later on. I think I was 16 or so um, un- until the final days of school. And then that dropped out for a while at university. And then I started it up again um, through a series of bizarre coincidences. Um, when I went, when I started my PhD, and as it turned out, uh, we had a lecturer in international relations and conflict resolution, which was nowhere near where I was. I was in the biochemistry department, who was already at that time um, an accredited fifth dan uh, martial arts instructor, uh, and in fact many dans in many martial arts. And his name is Stephen Chan, uh, and he took on the mantle of starting a small club and there was about three or four of us uh, at, the, at the at its genesis a bunch of guys getting together in a hall hmm. at the same time as i started there was a first year engineer uh, undergraduate whose name is wayne otto and uh over time he became the most decorated martial arts fighter of all time and is currently the um the the olympic and national and uh, martial arts instructor for karate in uh, in Norway, oh, wow. so that's become become his life. So we had this amazing traditional um, side of karate, as well as this extraordinary fighter that could show us the ropes. <laughs> and within two to three years, uh, it became the most successful university club in the country, a legacy which it continued well past my time, ten or fifteen years. And uh, 
it still has a strong showing and I, I still go back from time to time. If I'm in, in London, I'll train with my old instructor who's now about 70 and is now a 10th dad. So he's gone as high as he can go. Wow. Um, and I decided some time ago here after teaching in other clubs for 10 or 15 years that I wanted to do my own thing. And I started my own club up about seven or eight years ago with uh, a break for COVID and knee surgery. Ah, well, well, that could be a, a real challenge, I would imagine, with uh, with all the stuff that you do in, in karate as well. And um, yeah, we used to have a pastor in in one of the churches that I went to that was the he was our local instructor. Uh, and so we'd go to the lessons actually in the church, which was you know, you hear this thing of conflict resolution and karate instructor and pastor at a church and <laughs> karate leader. It's where, where my tie, my mental tie went to was it seems like there's something there that uh, they have they have something to work on as well. Well, absolutely. And I find that, you know, kids generally and, and, and people of all ages respond to these things so well. Mm. Um, and certainly, you know, I've got three boys. I, I taught them all from an early age. They haven't necessarily stayed in it, uh, but, you know, just given the uncertainties of the world and as a parent, I'm much, much happier know, knowing that they can react to a difficult situation than if I hadn't done that. So, uh, and we also do, or I do, um, usually as fundraisers, but not necessarily so, uh, you know, self-defense courses for, for folks and for women and so forth. And a lot of those things tend to be rather counterintuitive. You, you do things that you wouldn't think that you would ne necessarily do for a situation. And, you know, people enjoy themselves. It's a bit of fun and it keeps you fit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then you mentioned just a second ago that you're the, the president and CEO of Stressmark Biosciences. Um, what does Stressmark do? Stressmark started as a, uh, frankly, an antibody company. So um, what we do is make research tools. We don't, we're not in the diagnostic space. We're not in the therapeutic space. So we're not curing anybody of anything. What we're doing is we're providing those tools that allow researchers to, to do their research effectively. It's a little bit akin to the idea of a gold rush, if the gold rush is drug discovery, for instance. And we're making the best pails, picks, shovels, uh, possible for for those researchers to 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 do their work. So whether they fail or whether they succeed doesn't matter as long as they keep working. Uh, that's uh, that's sort of the uh, the idea. So uh, the better the tools, um, you know, the 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 more validated they are, the the, um, uh, the more likely we are to succeed. And we started uh, generating antibodies early on, but we sort of or I, I should really take ownership. I probably get the gold medal for starting a company at the worst possible time in the last hundred years, which was probably like three months before the uh, the, the financial crash. Mm. Um, but we got through that, um, and you know we had to change our business plan, just like so many other companies. Uh, but uh, we expanded our portfolio after that into different types of research tools, including uh, some proteins. Um, uh, as well as a small molecule portfolio, which are often failed drugs, but they have certain impacts in research settings that can be very, very useful. Uh, and then finally, we also started making some more complicated assays. And as an example, one of our um, best-selling ones actually is an assay that detects um, the uh, the damage to our DNA. So for instance, if, a, if you were conducting some sort of a trial whereby uh, you had smokers, for instance, whereby you know they're they're bringing in all sorts of free radicals. Your your DNA gets damaged, but we tend to be very good at fixing these things, so we repair. And um, the little bits, the leftovers from that repair process, is just excreted out in your urine. So it's very very easy to sample to get hold of. You know, it's not blood or anything, uh, and rather easy to detect. So that's, for instance, one of the the sorts of tools that we do. Now you might want to impact that by some sort of regime or or uh, in introduction of a drug or something, and then you might see differences in, in the outcome. So those are the kind of tools that that uh, that we make. And then about, I guess, seven years ago or so, we 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 went sideways, um, not sideways in a bad way. I mean, from a product portfolio perspective, what we were seeing was, you know, large and often um, government aided 
entities in China really coming into the antibody space, flooding the market with all sorts of stuff. A lot of it wasn't great, but you know it's still a numbers game. Uh, and to a certain extent, we couldn't compete. So uh, we were aiming to do things in a more complex space, uh, where which is you know these protein preparations, which is there's a lot more sort of science and black magic involved, if you like, uh, in some of this stuff. And uh, we were asked by a researcher to make a very, very specific product that is used as a, uh, as a, as a tool to generate a Parkinson's disease model um, in cells. And so we tried to, we, we made it look rather easy, to be honest. <laughs> um, and so you take these discrete building blocks of one particular protein and you literally grow them into something that looks like a string or a fibril. And uh, we did. Uh, we gave it to them and said, here you go. And they said, oh, great, thank you. It doesn't work. Huh. And yeah, that was, that, was, um, that was my reaction. My reaction was somewhere between, huh, and <laughs> do you know what you're doing? And of course, uh, they were right, and they presented us with the data. And I thought, this is very curious, because I'm a protein biochemist by trade, and that shouldn't happen. Uh, and again, a, a few months later, as I think we were discussing earlier, I, I had a eureka moment. Uh, um, and realized, you know, what we might have done, which was a typical thing that you would do in biochemistry. And we realized that depending on what the environment was, you could generate quite different strings or fibrils um, that would have wildly different properties from each other. And it could be in short-term experiments, really very black and white, like death and life, you know, very, very, <laughs> very different. And so... Um, we then realized also that the literature did not support this at all. The literature really dealt with one particular type only, and that, uh, you know, to 99% or so, and that most research had no idea that there was more than one potential outcome, uh, depending on how you made these things. Now, often they're not actually interested in the fibril themselves. They're interested in what happens downstream. We're making a model here sure. after all. Right. Um, but of course, what happens in our brains, you know, is rather important. So, it, you know, it, we began to show that there were variations. And from that point on, I also realized nobody else in the world was doing this. There wasn't a single entity worldwide, aside from perhaps, you know, things that we don't know about was bespoke uh, manufacturing from one company to a, a CRO or a clinical research organization or so. And so um, we jumped onto that bandwagon and put our foot down on the metal and uh, just started researching and developing new products that fit into neurodegenerative diseases as a whole. So mm -hmm. Alzheimer's, specific ones for Parkinson's, specific ones for ALS uh, and, and others. And this was of you know, great value, particularly to pharmaceutical companies. Sure. And the fact that we had generated different types um, was even more valuable to them because they came back and said, thank you for saving us three years of work. <laughs> Whereas on the academic side, it was much more muted because all of a sudden we were asking questions, you know, what have you been publishing for the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. Not always popular, right? Um, because it depended very much on, on, on the, the, the type of construct. And since then, you know, we've done all sorts of other variations on the themes and new ones and mixed versions even because, you know, the body is loaded, absolutely in, loaded with stuff and different types of proteins and so forth. So sometimes things will intercalate, they'll mix and um, they can even seed each other. So, you know, it, it gets pretty complicated, um, but we're able to generate these tools and sometimes even make them visual in the sense that we can put tags on them that you can follow. So you can see where this thing is actually going in cells or in the brain or, you know, wherever, whatever ex type of experimentation you're doing. So that's the flagship now. Uh, and we've we've really um, generated a brand now that is recognized in the neurodegenerative disease research space. Um, even though we started in something really quite different, antibody company aimed at, as the name might suggest, the cellular stress space, particularly cancer. Um, but now the flagship and the efforts are very much in the neuro neurodegenerative disease tool space. And do you ever do work, so you mentioned specifically drug companies for this, but the, uh, do you ever do work with diagnostics companies as well? I mean, as they're targeting different things for diagnostic, I would imagine that this could have application as well. 
We haven't to date. Um, it's not that we rule them out or anything. Uh, it's just that uh, you know they might they might use our tools but because our tools are not um they don't you know we haven't done all the paperwork to get it for instance validated as a um, as a diagnostic um we're slightly i guess we're parallel to that space if you like right um the tools often are very very similar uh, except that one goes to the validation and you know let's say five years and ten million dollars that's not something i'm willing to do uh, uh from my perspective but um we, we do work with service companies. So mm -hmm. for instance, clinical research organizations where they're trying to provide a service, whatever it is, and they need to generate the model so that, you know, their pharma company that's outsourcing their work, you know, can, can, can throw their drugs into whatever the model is and, and see what happens. So probably less so on the diagnostic side, although from time to time, we're probably, we've probably sold standards to them and so forth that uh, we don't even know about uh, because sometimes you get these huge companies and they order something you have no idea where it's going you may not even know what what country it's ending up in yeah so in addition to what you're doing now in in terms of you know parkinson's and and other degenerative d diseases are you also still working on the cancer side as well or is it just a smaller portion of your business i would say so it, it's 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 in in part still some of the bread and butter of the business because it's very established. Mm -hmm. um, and we also sell to other companies that resell our products. Okay. That's another model that exists here. I mean, exists, I guess, in all business really, but people don't talk about it very much, but it's, it is the backbone, in fact, of, of, of many businesses, you know, Walmart sure as heck doesn't make all those products, right? They come from somewhere else, even though they may have a Walmart product a label on them, for instance, and the same goes for anything else. Um, you know, so from that perspective, I would say probably roughly half of what we do is still in that cancer space, whereas the other half has really gone from zero onwards to about just over half the business now, but it's purely additive. So it hasn't replaced the business. It's just new business. Okay. And then the companies that normally uh, come to Stressmark, are they, I guess, what category do they fit in? Are they very early stage? Or are they, um, you know, kind of mid-stage? Are they at any life cycle of a drug company? I mean, you mentioned large companies. I mean, so I know that's in the category, yeah. but just, you know, curious, it, what does a customer look like whenever they come to you? Yeah, it, it's it's the whole gamut. Uh, it's a single, all the way from a single researcher uh, who's thinking of starting up a company, <laughs> all the way to the largest company, pharma companies in the world, the Pfizer's, the Glaxo's, the Regeneron's, etc. They they all have a program. Now they obviously have take Regeneron. I mean, they have established sales through existing drugs and so forth, and you know do very well. But of course, they also have this pipeline um, of potential new uh, drugs that they, they, they want to test and, and ultimately get into clinical trials. But there's this whole preclinical side to that, um, to that cycle. Sure. So you have to, you know, you, you, first of all, you know, I guess you, you, you do your in vitro work, you know, essentially anything outside of a living system, then you begin to introduce it into living systems, living cells, then you might go into a rodent trial. And then when you've done all your, your, your work, and you've submitted your materials to the FDA, you would think about clinical trials, a safety trial being the first thing uh, in humans. So that's, I mean, it's quite easy to say that five to 10 years of work would go into that before you ever get to a clinical trial setting. Uh, and, and the big companies do that. Um, the uh, the mid-size, the, the, the biotechs, the genzymes and bio, biogens, which I'm not even sure why I'm calling them mid-size because they're not really, they're just not as big as the other guys. Right. But all the way, all the way to, you know, bespoke what you might think of as a one trick pony. This is what they do. Um, they have one drug candidate and they're, they're trying to see if, uh, push that through. So it really is the, the, the full cycle just in the, in the same preclinical phase. Very good. Yeah, it seems like there. I mean, there's just so much work going on, you know, with degenerative diseases right now. Um, you know, just I mean, it was funny because I think I think it was um, one of the investor groups that actually come out and said uh, last year was like one of the bigger sort of um, neurological investment years uh, overall. 
And I mean, it's just interesting to, to hear whenever, I mean, we're still very much fighting cancer and it feels like, you know, that these other, these other diseases also, you know, need, you know, very strong investment as well. Well, that, that's true. So there's been a number of things happening, uh, uh, probably two main ones. We had COVID, of course. Um, that's not a mystery to anybody. But of course, that technology was really set up initially to fight cancer, right? Mm -hmm. That's That was the idea. And then COVID came along, hey, we can use this uh, and it's faster, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but realistically, I think we're seeing more and more you know, patent applications and so forth and research into the use of the RNA technology, because what you can literally do is you can immunize somebody against their own cancer. Now, your own cells, your own body is switched off um, in terms of attacking itself for obvious reasons, right? You'd be dead in a hurry if that wasn't the case, right. uh, which is why cancers are successful against us. But if you can find a small piece of it that's a little bit different from what it's supposed to be and tell the immune system that, and and allow it to target that cancer very very specifically um, then you can be very very successful so that's the great promise ironically of what's come out of this whole coronavirus situation it's not actually i would argue COVID as such it's it's probably i think the cancer is at least going uh, going forwards and in terms of the neuro side i mean there's been some high profile um drug failures uh, and some successes. So the, the, the Adu Helm, I think it was called, you know, where, where we had the situation where the uh, Food and Drug Administration actually said, yes, we will authorize this, um, but we're not really following the rules we always followed before. Uh, different situation, a lot of criticism. But on the other hand, does give the industry a boost to say, look, there's some hope. This does do something. And there is nothing else. We have nothing. We, we don't have a thing, really. Uh, and, you know, I say that with some experience. My, my, I think everybody we know has, knows somebody else who's had a neurodegenerative disease of some type. Sure. I'm no different. And we all know that the drugs that they take, frankly, you know, whether they do something or not is not clear. They, often they weren't uh, even generated to deal uh, with a neurodegenerative disease. And so you get you end up with people taking all sorts of drugs that may or may not really work. And, and, and you know, these things run their course. So the emphasis is not just anymore on curing. The emphasis on, you know, if you can delay something long enough that, you know, something is slowed down to a significant degree, then the quality of life side changes dramatically. And more importantly, I think for, you know, politicians and so forth and people that are funding this research is the amount of monies that are then involved in having to help these folks in their day, you know, anything from walking and getting groceries and, and going to the bathroom. I mean, everything right. goes down dramatically. Uh, and so it, from that perspective, it's very attractive. But there's definitely an uptick in, in that area. And some of the, 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 the monoclonal antibody technologies and so forth have definitely played into that, um, into that realm. Yeah, I mean the the COVID vaccine uh, delivery, you know, overall to me was one of those things where I I was interviewed on a podcast, you know, early on in COVID, uh, and was asked that question, you know, how long is it going to be before we have, you know, a vaccine? And I said, well, look, I mean, if there's something else that's in the pipeline, maybe there's hope, you know, between you know now and in in some you know distant time. But I mean, if you look at the normal timeline for most of these vaccines, it's like 10 plus years. So how much do you expect them to pull in the timeline of 10 years to, you know, to now? And, and I it's funny because I, I was working with a couple of different clients who had, you know, potential candidates and they came along and they said, hey, you know, hey, look, we think actually we have something here, you know, that we just, you know, need to run some additional tests to make sure. And um, yeah, I mean, to me, it's one of those things that as a, as an outsider, I am not a, a, a biochemist and <laughs> um, by trade. Um, and, you know, so I'm somebody just sitting on the sideline, just going, man, this is ma amazing to watch, uh, watch science and, and what can be done and what's been learned already. So. Yes, I had a slight advantage. I had a good, very good friend of mine that I worked with at MIT that had worked for Moderna. Uh, early on, and Moderna is is an ex MIT company, at least to some degree. Um, 
the uh, one of the founders was uh, was a guy that actually our lab used to to uh, collaborate with a very famous scientist, and um, so I knew the technology beforehand, and I think it was all really aimed at the cancer ideal, if you like, mm-hmm. um, and regardless of where you stand on yes this was a good idea or all the way down to it was unethical and whatever um the data is in there's a lot of information on it now because so many doses went out uh, and so many people have taken them so the data is there regardless mm-hmm. um on on how how the human bodies reacted to these and and uh, effectively kept the vast majority of people out of hospital, which was, of course, the idea. Um, but I think um, going forward, we're going to see, I mean, we've already seen some rather interesting and, and very promising areas uh, in, in, from the cancer perspective, the cancer curing perspective with this CAR-T technology, which is essentially doing something similar where you're you're enabling uh, these, these, these T cells, these cells yeah. that generate these antibodies to actually attack a cancer, whereas under normal conditions, they wouldn't be able to. And they're yours. It's not a funny little molecule that somebody's made in their garage, right? Or that that could kill you. It's actually your own immune system. And the immune system, if you consider everything you go through life, is ridiculously powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's staggering what it does on a day-to-day basis. Um, So it's probably the best way forward. So it's definitely probably the most exciting time, I think, that we've had with the exception perhaps of you know the early dna technology in in, in the early 90s uh, the, the pcr that we've right. all got to know now this polymerase chain reaction thing yeah and it's i mean it, it's funny that you say that because people that, that have listened to this podcast before they will have heard me say this as well that i mean i just i really do feel like we are at a phenomenal time for science because you can see so much and you can can do so much um we still have a lot more to learn and it's not like, you know, we know everything about one CAR T cell therapy and its effectiveness. Um, you know, sometimes it's too effective, um, you know, and then NK cell, you know, therapy, similar sort of thing. Uh, you know, lots of people working on that. I mean, I see all the advances with CRISPR and, and, you know, stuff that people are working on there. I mean, it's just, it is just an amazing uh, time for, for, I believe, life sciences, which brings me more or less to my, my next question for you is, how did you get involved in life sciences? And, and what is it that, um, you know, more or less keeps you energized about this field? Well, the first part of that question is easy to answer. I was good at chemistry. I was good at biology in high school. I didn't know which one to pursue, so I figured living systems would be the way to go. Mm. Um, I um, my father was a scientist as well; he was a chemist. Uh, I'm I'm unlikely to reach his heights. He worked for a Nobel Prize winning lab, uh, the Calvin. He worked for Professor Calvin, and you may be familiar with the Calvin cycle and photosynthesis and so sure. forth. So, uh, but he came down with uh, uh, with with Alzheimer's. Actually, died this year, and I've known too many people with these diseases and it just keeps me energized and i know that um, knowing what we do because we do this day in and day out we make these materials we make these tools we know more about them than anybody else um, at least from a commercial perspective i don't you know i can't throw myself into the, the realms of, of research labs uh, uh private research labs or something so uh, as a result of that i think we can carve up or uh, carve off time that is valuable uh, to the folks that are actually doing the drug discovery. And frankly, it makes me feel good that we have an impact. And, or when we talk to these labs uh, on the folks in there, and sometimes, you know, we've had conference calls with 30 people across three, four different countries. And, you know, the feedback is generally very, very positive. And it's just, look, thanks for sharing this because it really does save us a lot of time. Yeah. And very good. It's, it's, Yeah, it's a feel-good factor, I guess. Yeah. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest, and we kind of touched on one of them here. But uh, the first one is, what inspires you? Yeah, I think for me, it's generally how how people react to adversity because uh, it's it's the one thing that I've always felt. I've seen executives and so forth uh, get tremendous accolades but during times when you could almost not set a foot wrong, 
Um, you know, the dot com boom is, is almost right. like a superlative of that, where you could quite literally take a goat, stick it on a table and say, hey, give me some money and somebody would have done. There, there's there's no skill in that. But but dealing with, um, you know, the world that we live in, which has really been changed since 9-11, whether it's 9-11, whether it's the pandemic, whether it's, uh, uh, you know, the swine flu at the time with the financial crisis. I mean, we have all these things thrown at us that really have an impact and a big impact. And a lot of companies go to the wall. So for me, it's how, how, do, how well do people respond, not to the good days, but to the difficult ones. Mm. Yeah, very good. And then secondly, what concerns you? I think uh, I, I would just so as a direct sort of follow on from that, one of the things we have going now is Europe is at war again, or parts of Europe are at war. And as, as a European that really grew up under the banner of the European Union, I, you know, I do believe in this solidifying of, of, of economic ties to literally bind people together so they almost can't go to war even if they want to. Um, and I believe it works, uh, has worked rather well. And so um, my concern is how this happened in the first place, uh, but more so what where people are getting their information from. We, we've gone from... Uh, it doesn't matter whether it's science has actually probably been less affected, uh, perhaps with the exception of some of the things that have been said by politicians in recent years. But, but you know, there are uh, people getting their information on world affairs from TikTok. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, that, that frightens me. That concerns me because, um, you know, there's plenty of well-meaning people that don't necessarily have the education or, or the means or whatever. Uh, to 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 uh, to know what's going on in the world, and then these easy to 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 access platforms can I think cause a lot of trouble. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you that you say that because I I, I mean I I typically have referenced a couple of different things. I mean, one I remember as I was getting ready to graduate with my MBA um, during the graduation ceremony, the 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 person that was speaking, you know, came up and just said, you know, look, I know as you're leaving uh, this education, most of you, a good portion of you, and I, and I want to say it was like greater than 90% of the population that was there will never pick up another book in their lifetime. And I just thought, how terrifying is that? Because if, if all of the information that you get is either from the television or you know, now TikTok, um, it's pretty terrifying. I mean, that, that you, you don't use some level of scientific decision-making in your life to say, you know, do I really believe this or do I want to go test this theory uh, and see whether or not if this is true or, or not? And the other unfortunate thing is that I feel like any sort of belief that you have, uh, you can validate it on the internet anyway. I mean, uh, you know, I could, you know, say that the earth is flat. And I'll, I'll bet you I could find lots of websites that validate that theory, uh, even yeah. though, you know, I don't believe it. But it's one of those things where, you know, I I hear people say that you're allowed to have your your own belief and believe what is true. And it's, I don't believe that. I think, I think what's true is true and should be able to be proven. Uh, and you should be able to walk that back. But I, it, there's a level of just, I, I guess, just people that, that don't test things enough in the world now that, that would make your concern a reality. But we have, we have seen a walk back in terms of, um, you know, certain what we take for granted in the West, these, you know, these freedoms and so forth. You know, you've seen, um, you know, whether it's China, Russia, other places where there was some, real flow of information but it's this 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 hardening um of the shell that surrounds uh, these countries that you know makes it more difficult not not impossible but more difficult especially for average folks to mm -hmm. to uh to get information and we also often make the assumption if we haven't been there before that they live the same way we do and in some cases that's true in other cases it really isn't true right um so, uh, you know, they don't necessarily have access. They may not have a computer in the house, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And then lastly, what excites you? I, I can't help being excited uh, uh, about the future because I think, um, you know, for every, every difficulty, there's a solution. And, uh, you know, we, we have reached a point where 
uh, you know, the biggest challenge probably for all of us is the planet. Um, you know, we can't ignore it anymore. And I think we did ourselves a disservice in a way when we talked about the word global warming, mm. because I'm not sure pe people thought, ooh, okay, I spend my time in Northern Holland and I freeze in the summer, so I don't have to go to Spain anymore. Um, and and I, I'm being a bit facetious, but, right. but you know, generally, what, who cares about one degree? But from the scientific perspective that nobody, I think, really bothered talking about is imagine the amount of energy that is involved in a one degree change across sure. the planet. Yeah. And what that means for winds and for depressions and cold weather, as it is for hot weather mm -hmm. and, and, and so forth. I mean, these, are, these amounts are stupendous. And of course, we're seeing increased hurricanes and, and highs and lows and, and, and what have you. Um, so, but I think we've actually figured it out. Uh, and ironically, I do wonder whether the situation that we have in Europe is actually going to really accelerate uh, by, um, well, for the worst reasons, the uh, the real implementation of green, uh, call it green or, or carbon neutral energies, because they've actually come quite far. Uh, I, I had a bird's eye view into this as a kid because my father was uh, actually working. He was the, the, the funder of the European... Um, uh, renewable energies uh, section for the EU. And, you know, early on when I was a kid, you'd be lucky if you got one or 2% uh, of <laughs> right. the nation's grid. And now we're talking 10 times that, sure. you know, the 10s, 20s, and 25s. So it is doable. And if this pushes us into a better place, then maybe that's a silver lining. Well, very nice. Well, Ariel, thank you so much for, for joining me. I greatly appreciate it. And uh, we will have all the links for Stressmark and how to find Stressmark Biosciences as well uh, online on the page uh, after the interview. So thanks so much for being here. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you again.